give it a few seconds for more people. People are joining at the moment. Right, I think I'll start as people are joining still, but slow down a bit. So, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are from, to our partners and our panelists. Welcome to this launch of No One Worse Off report. Uh, I think as you realize this is being recorded. I just I want to say a few introductory words before we go to the presentation of the findings of the report and then to the panelists. Uh, but I'm Greg Munro, I'm the director of Cities Alliance, the new director of Cities Alliance, even though it's an organization that I know well. And for those of you that don't know me, my first degree that I ever did in life was actually medicine. And in 1984, I duly lined up with all my other colleagues at graduation or just before graduation and did the Hippocratic Oath, which the original Hippocratic Oath was written, we think, in two, the year 275. And it states that I will do no harm or injustice to my patients. And the modern versions of, of the Hippocratic Oath, which I did in 1984, um, coined the term do no harm. That always try to heal and make better your patient, but at the very least, do no harm to them. And so too for infrastructure projects in cities. Do no harm, leave people definitely not and certainly not worse off and hopefully much better off. The population growth patterns of cities, as we all know, are significant. And in the case of Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, the urban population is projected to double in the next 25 years and much of that growth will be in informality. In Adequate infrastructure to respond to urban, urbanization needs is key. And the global investment demand today for urban infrastructure is estimated to be around $5 trillion annually. Impacts of a changing climate and the ways in which major infrastructure and urban areas are planned certainly needs to have resilient environmental, social, and economic systems that can withstand anticipated shocks and stresses, and particularly when experienced through the eyes of the urban poor. Now, many agencies and the development banks have invested significantly over the years in safeguards. And most, if not all, major donor governments insist on them. So we are not operating in a vacuum. I mean, safeguards have existed and exist for years. However, increased rapid urbanization, continued vulnerability of the urban poor, and exponentially increasing effects of climate change mean we have to constantly revisit our safeguards to question ourselves to ensure that they are up to date and fit for purpose. So while acknowledging the work already done on safeguards, we need to understand that our approach is dynamic. It needs to be constantly evaluated and reinforced. And there's a strong need to review existing practices, challenges and reforms, and to learn from each other to safeguard new investments as we go forward. So we need to frequently ask the question, which is in this research, in this, this paper that we did, which is what do the existing environmental and social safeguard systems, do they work, do they still work effectively in the context of informality, infrastructure development and climate change? So the report, the report that we are, are releasing today is commissioned by Cities Alliance and its member part, partners, SECO and BMZ, both members of Cities Alliance. And it looks into the landscape of existing safeguards and illustrates how environmental and social impact assessments can help address informality in cities 
and formulates key messages to increase the sustainability of infrastructure projects to benefit the resilience of the whole city. Now, the structure of our next 90 minutes, uh, Bryony will, uh, Bryony Wormsley will do the presentation of the findings, the main findings of the report. Um, from there, we'll have a panel discussion with our partners, BMZ, SECO, African Development Bank, World Bank, um, Islamic Development Bank, and Cities Alliance. We will have some space, very short space for some questions from the audience or issues of clarification, and then we'll have some closing reflection, reflections. So today's webinar is a, a launch of the report, which will be part of a continuum of ongoing work to strengthen safeguards for the benefit of the urban poor. So once again, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. I'm going to first go to Bryony for the presentation of the report, and then I'll come to, the, to introduce the panel individually. Bryony, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Thank you. <clears throat> and good afternoon, everyone. And yes, thank you for the, the introduction and the background to the project. Um, I'm going to present the key findings of a, a study I conducted for Cities Alliance on the role of environmental and social safeguards for resilient infrastructure projects in cities. Um, just hoping this will advance. Oh, we have we tried this earlier. I'm very sorry. We tried this earlier. <laughs> I Excuse me. I'm going to have to stop sharing for a minute and try again. There we go. Okay, I think it's now advancing. Yes, sorry about that. <clears throat> um, so yes, my um, paper's just going to give a little overview, very short overview of some of the environmental and social safeguards that are in place, both national systems and development finance institution safeguards, looking at some of the strengths and weaknesses in theory and practice, some conclusions and recommendations. So the research question uh, for my work was, do the existing environmental and social safeguard systems work effectively in the context, particularly of informality, infrastructure development and climate change? And while I was, I was thinking and pondering about this question, I actually thought, well, let me think of it another way. And I asked the question, how would our cities look without any environmental and social safeguards being in place? or being enforced? And I wasn't sure of the answer. Uh, would they be the same? Would they look worse off? Or really, you know, hopefully, would they look, do they look better off? Um, and so that was um, a question which I'll see if we can answer by the end of this presentation. Um, there are two interrelated safeguard systems at play. First of all, you've got the national laws and regulations on environmental and social impact assessment. Um, and for many countries now, there is a clause in the law for strategic environmental assessment for all policies, plans and programs. And my study is based on um, most of the countries in sub-Saharan Africa. So these comments really relate to that. Um, linked as well to that are the um, Development Finance Institutions ENS appraisal processes, which is they have all of the most development banks have some sort of internal appraisal and safeguard system. Um, but the project approval is based usually, amongst many other things, <clears throat> on the environmental and social impact assessment report. And a lot of them rely on national authority management and administration systems for project compliance. So the two, two systems are most definitely linked and rely upon each other. And the typical environmental and social impact assessment process 
follows largely the same steps um, across most countries. There is um, a screening phase followed by scoping, followed by an environmental and social impact assessment report, which leads to environmental and social management plans and monitoring plans, and ultimately to project implementation phase where we have um, compliance auditing and monitoring. So it is an administrative and a regulatory process whereby environmental and social impacts are systematically um, um, evaluated um, to determine the impact of the overall project. Occurring throughout the whole process is of course stakeholder engagement. So that's the typical environmental process. Um, from my review of those countries um, in Sub-Saharan Africa, my first conclusion of the study is around whether the national um, environmental requirements are adequate to address climate change and informality. Uh, my conclusions are as follows. Basically, in theory, yeah, most national systems cover most things, but there's a very big but. One of the biggest problems is that most legislation predates um, climate change policies and action plans. Uh, so there's no legal requirement or guidance in the legislation dictating the need for climate change risk assessments, the consideration of greenhouse gas emissions, or anything else. So that it's kind of lacking in the legislation. That's the first thing. Um, secondly, in the national um, systems, um, social impacts um, are not always properly included or included at all. And this stems from, from many different reasons, one of which is the um, definitions of environment. Um, in many countries still describe the environment as being the biophysical environment, and they do not consider um, social and human environments as being part of that term. Um, and there's no definition of what do we mean by social or that social and human and cultural issues are part of the environment. So already there are some weaknesses there and therefore social issues, including gender and health tend to get overlooked. Another challenge in this is it's very difficult to do effective social research in informal areas where there are often many illegal people who, who don't want to be seen. And illegal either in terms of their, their country of nationality or could be because um, they um, may be gay or prostitutes or some other um, thing in a country where that is illegal. So it's very difficult to do effective social research in these areas. Another key finding here is that resettlement action plans are often done separately from the environmental impact assessment report. This is a huge problem. Often they're done after the environmental report's been finished. So it's very difficult. Um, the, the real impacts of resettlement only are apparent once the resettlement action plan has been done. And therefore that's not captured in the ESIA report. So there's a real disconnect between these two processes which should be linked and aren't. Um, another common problem is there's a lack of expertise amongst our national environmental authorities um, relating to climate change and social issues. Um, and so the environmental impact assessments don't really have a, a good uh, um, rigorous scrutiny in terms of climate change risk and social impacts. Um, and another issue is, and this is common really throughout, is that there is inadequate compliance auditing by the government authorities during pro project implementation. This is due to a huge number of factors, um, in, mostly to do with capacity and resources. And as a result of that, the contractors basically do what they want, which is a very sad finding. Now on the other side of the, of the safeguard system, are the development finance institutions. They are funding um, most of the big and massive boom in infrastructure that's going on in sub-Saharan Africa. Most, but definitely not all, of these um, funding agencies have environmental and social safeguard systems in place, which have um, very laudable aims and objectives of protecting the public, especially the poor and the most vulnerable, promoting equality, health and well-being, protecting the environment, encouraging sustainable development and improving life. And the environmental and social safeguard systems of the development finance institutions um, 
go in parallel with the project life cycle through here and the impact assessment stages, which I explained earlier through here. And what is most important of this diagram here is that each stage of each process needs to be in sync to obtain the best outcomes. And one of the biggest problems is that um, people try to seek and get and obtain loan agreements um, too soon in the environmental process. So environmental and social impact assessments should really be done at the detailed feasibility stage. Um, and that should be what's appraised on the basis of the loan agreements. But often that, that process gets out of sync and that causes some problems in itself. So my conclusions um, around some of the gaps and weaknesses of the safeguard systems, as I looked at seven different safeguard systems, um, um, of some of the major uh, funders within Southern Africa um, is that one of the ones was that scoping reports are not usually reviewed, which is interesting. Um, and that's usually the first round of public consultation occurs during scoping. So that was, that was an interesting finding. Um, that, as I've mentioned, the ESIA is done often too early in the process. So we're doing a detailed ESIA on, on a project concept without adequate information. The report appraisal by DFI staff is, is not always as rigorous as it should be. There's often project scope creep after the environmental and social impact assessments being completed. One of the biggest issues here is that there'll be a big delay and time lag between project approval or ESIA approval, I should say, and final loan negotiations and then final implementation. And often many years can go by um, in that time. And of course, environmental and social situations on the ground can change completely in that time. Um, cost, this cost, cost of mitigation is not accurate, accurately calculated or reflected in, in loan agreements. So I'm talking environmental and social mitigation. It's usually in a lump sum. And what I found in a lot of my research is I have found very little in the way of detailed accounting for expenditure on environmental and social mitigation um, at the detailed level. Um, there are bills and quantities which will count for, for all sorts of engineering stuff. But when it comes to environmental and social mitigation, there's very little accounting for actual expenditure. Are we spending the money on that mitigation? I don't know. Another problem is inconsistencies in procurement. For example, the environmental and social management plan is often not included in the tender documents. And this makes it incredibly difficult to expect the contractors to, to um, implement the desired ESMP requirements um, when it's not even in the contract documents in the first place. And then the final problem is that the project implementation monitoring and compliance auditing is often very weak. And there's far too much reliance on national environmental authorities who, as I mentioned earlier, are often under-resourced and under-capacitated to do that level of, of, of diligence and compliance auditing. So what do we do? I mean, is ESIA really working? And there are a number of, of flaws still in the system. We, it, and as I, the question is, yes, in theory, it's all there, but in practice, there are still some huge problems. Um, but my, my question really is, is ESIA the right tool to be using in large urban settings where there's often many um, multiple developments going on all at once um, in a very complex environment. And are individual EIAs the right tool? And we looked at um, the project, the number of projects going on in Kampala and Uganda um, to, which, to try and illustrate how this uh, could be better looked at rather than individual EIAs for each individual project. And of course, the tool strategic environmental assessment is, is available. And as I said before, most of the recent legislation in Sub-Saharan Africa requires um, SEAs to be conducted for policies, plans, and programs. OECD defined um, SEA as a range of analytical and participatory approaches that aim to integrate environmental considerations into policies, plans, and programs, and evaluate the interlinkages with socioeconomic considerations. SEA can be applied also to sectoral developments, for example, the telecoms industry, or concentrated developments in a defined area or region. 
And as mentioned in Kampala, there are at least 14 major developments going on at the very at the moment. Uh, so that would be defined as a, a number of concentrated um, developments in a, in a region. So where does ESIA and SEA, where, what, what are the differences and where do they sit? Well, in a, in a nutshell, um, ESIA is, is reactionary to individual projects. Um, and in terms of its potential to influence sustainable development, it, it's quite low because it is reacting to a project proposal. Whereas strategic environmental assessment, as I say, is, is applied at policy level, national development planning level, and regional, provincial, and local authority land use plans and zoning. So this is where you have city land use plans, zoning plans, um, which would be far better um, suited to um, an SEA than an ESIA because um, of the multi-dimensional nature of those projects, but also there's greater influence to, um, potential to influence sustainable development and to meet the sustainable development goals. Um, so what are the benefits? It allows the alignment of national policy with national international goals, as I said, with the SDGs and other international obligations, for example, the Paris Agreement. Um, and one of the strengths of SEA is the, the way you use it um, to sketch various potential scenarios to, to look at um, the, the policy plan or program you're evaluating. And you can then work it through various scenarios of say climate change scenarios. You know, there are often more than one climate change scenario that might pertain in an area. But you can also look at scenarios, for example, around city growth and migration as well. So it gives you a great flexibility, particularly in the urban environment. Um, it's usually done at a very early stage of policy plan and program development. And so it can provide early warnings around the risks, particularly climate risks cumulative effects and the unintended consequences. And it also encourages a multidisciplinary approach um, to development and at all tiers of, and it gets national, regional, local governments um, talking to each other. So there's many benefits. Um, it promotes active stakeholder in involvement and it, it doesn't replace ESIA, but it does provide the framework for future ESIAs and ESMPs by setting environmental quality objectives, targets and constraints. Um, so it actually provides a sort of guiding, um, provides um, a guiding uh, framework for ESIA and ESMP. And it also it identifies key performance indicators to, to judge and assess the success of the policy plan or program in terms of, for example, sustainable development goals. As I say, it's very participatory and it's the very nature of SEO. It involves all the sectors through from the informal sector, through the formal sector, government to non-governmental institutions. So my third conclusion about the um, um, was are SEAs um, useful in the urban environment for assessing policies, plans, and programs? And are they effective? Well, the problem here is that SEAs have rarely been commissioned to consider the impacts of large-scale country development programs, and they're rarely applied. Um, and although they're prescribed in many countries, few are being done for a number of reasons, including um, sort of country ownership issues, costs, time required, um, stakeholder engagement challenges, capacity constraints, and so on. Um, and so there's a lot of room for, for development of particularly the, the regulations and guidelines around SEA to make it clearer. Um, but I also think there's a role here for DFIs and um, um, agencies such as Cities Alliance to promote the use of this as a very useful tool for city development. So the Initial question I had, um, are environmental and social safeguards effective in informal urban environments? Well, sadly, the question, the answer really is, well, yes, no, maybe. Um, it is not very clear. And I, I'm, I'm not entirely sure that um, we can answer that with any certainty in any of those categories. And it very much depends on the project location, 
the DFIs involved, the politics and political will of the country that's involved, the strength of the NGOs in that country, the capacities of local authorities to plan, implement and enforce the city planning tools, and of course funding. So um, without all these things being in place, then some of these um, safeguards, it's very difficult to make sure they happen. So in conclusion, my recommendations for Cities Alliance um, is, uh, as I said, the promotion of SEA as a proactive participatory tool, um, and this needs to be advocated at, at um, government level, DFI level, needs to be more support for the development of regulations and guidelines, and capacity building at all levels. And that also needs to be an increase in focus on post ESIA project implementation phase, particularly around budgeting, auditing of those budgets and expenditures, um, strengthening national capacities to, to carry out competent compliance audits, and, um, and imposing greater penalties for non. So I'm going to close with this quote, there is no excuse for any company, lender or investor to claim to be unaware that their, human, their investments could impact human rights. And this ties in a bit with what Greg said earlier about the Hippocratic Oath, that we should leave no one worse off. And there really is no longer an excuse in these days to um, leave anyone worse off because we have the safeguard systems in place. We just need to implement them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bryony. And uh, there is a question in the chat, but I'm going to hold the questions till the end. So I want to go straight into our panels, panel discussion. We've got uh, six panelists um, who will each spend about five minutes giving us their input. And uh, I'll start immediately with the first of our two partners that, that made this report happen. And that is Dr. Heike Litzinger, who is the head of urban development Division in the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development, known as BMZ. Heike, I did see you online. Heike, can you Heike, can you hear us? Okay, we'll come back to Heike. I will. Uh, move straight to the second speaker, which is the second partner who made this this report uh, a reality. And that's Dr. Dagmar Vogel, who is the head of infrastructure and financing division in, in SECO, the Swiss State Secretariat for Economic Affairs. Dagmar? Yes, can I? thank you, Greg. Thank you very much for giving me the word. And also thanks a lot for, well, the Cities Alliance and also Bryony for your input. Um, I mean, I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. And um, the, the thing is now, where should we start? Of course, I mean, everybody, the DFIs, uh, the NGOs, um, the local governments have to take really steps towards, um, I agree, strategic environmental um, assessments. Um, I think there is no way around it. But what is the final objective? I think we have uh, seen now um, a lot of difficulties we all have uh, with environmental impact assessments when it comes to project-wise uh, assessments, but also when when it comes to an overall development of uh, of um, of cities. And um, I would my my proposal would be really to have one specific aspect that very much in mind is the the final objective to have the issues of climate change and. Um, and uh, the, the, the population and the underprivileged, obviously, to be a director's business, a mayor's business, a minister's business, as much as it is the, the financial issues, the engineering issues. And uh, why I'm saying this, um, uh, I think it's not so much on purpose how things happen and, and why, why the results are not as, as good as, as they should be. We have a lot lots of good reports lots of good uh, good intentions but it's just not enough on on the agenda of the responsibles and of course there is not enough capacities there is not enough not the, the right rules and regulations and the capacities i totally agree we have to work on all of this but the objective would really be to have um a, a system in place where um decision making is taking 
the um, uh, overall responsibility for also for all the population, including the um, the the informal sector, and also the global problems like like climate change. And um, I think it is uh, working on also uh, the capacities. It's working on responsibilities and also having like processes and and, and responsible. Um, institutions in place. And I think we as DFI can very much support um, um, the way towards this, um, uh, this objective by supporting strategic environmental assessments, by um, having um, all the, the um, uh, groups of population, including also the private sector and other, um, uh, other stakeholder groups, to so having them included in the overall urban planning um, uh, as well as when uh, when we plan uh, individual projects. So I think we should go towards this end, on one hand, on single investments, but also support more um, the overall planning towards a strategic environmental and social, um, social uh, assessment and process. That will be a first, just the first input, but uh, I would give back the word to Greg, please, to add there is a couple of more, more panelists. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Dachman. If there's time at the end, we'll come back to you as well. I'm still not, I'm now, I seem to have lost Heike Blitzinger. So I'm going to go straight on to the third speaker. So Alice Nabalamba is the Chief Urban Development Specialist for Infrastructure, Cities and Urban Development Department in the African Development Bank. Alice, I do see you online. And you're on mute. There we go. There you are. Good. Uh, yes. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Alice Nabalamba, and I happen to be in uh, just in the vicinity of Kampala right now. I normally live in Abidjan, but uh, I'm here for uh, you know some personal uh, reasons, and uh, I you know I agree with uh, Bryony as well. Uh, on, on the uh, presentation. Yes, on the presentation um, and what uh, DFIs could possibly do. Um, just before the, uh, just before the, uh, the, the COVID-19, uh, uh, the African Development Bank had just approved uh, a large project on the rehabilitation of about 67 kilometers of road in Kampala itself. And uh, I know that this, uh, this particular project actually was uh, very good in the sense that uh, it really uh, delved into this uh, issue of uh, uh, environmental and social uh, safeguards and uh, the impact of this uh, project, of the project on the uh, Population. Uh, most of the roads are in the uh, industrial area or in uh, what we categorize as uh, informal settlements. So a whole lot of people would have been uh, affected by it, uh, by, by the project. But um, as uh, shortly after the uh, approval of this uh, you know, project, uh, COVID-19 hit. And uh, so we had to change uh, the, the approach. Uh, so the Implementation of that project is uh, still on hold. It hasn't started, but we had uh, the bank uh, had to quickly jump in to support uh, countries. So we set aside uh, ten billion dollars to support all countries, middle income as well as uh, uh, low income countries, low income meaning uh, Uganda. At the same time, uh, the government was uh, developing a physical plan for the what we call. Uh, the Jinja, Kampala, PG uh, regional uh, physical plan. But I think uh, this is one of the areas, uh, we are financing that as well. This is one of the areas uh, where it became very clear that uh, doing uh, projects that are uncoordinated uh, is just uh, is, is is not a, is not a good thing. It would definitely have have a negative impact uh, on the community, but also, but most importantly, on the uh, poor in the in those uh, communities. So as we are 
developing, as um, Brianna mentioned, uh, I think uh, she mentioned there were about six or seven projects uh, going on at the same time, uh, being financed by different uh, DFIs. Um, but all of them, uh, most of them are not even aware of the, uh, the, this physical plan that we're developing. And even the Kampala, the Kampala Road Rehabilitation Project, which we had uh, uh, financed, was also not uh, aware of this uh, physical plan. But uh, moving forward, I think uh, one way to, you know, to have better coordination, to have better um, coordination of the projects, and also ensuring that uh, the people that are going to benefit from those projects uh, are not impacted uh, in a negative way is to work within uh, or work with the governments to ensure that all projects somehow fit within the, the physical within this physical plan for this region. This is the largest urban area uh, with about 2,000 uh, square a square an area of about 2,000 square kilometers. So it's it's you know the largest uh, economic uh, area of uh, economic activity. So it means that if we work together, if all the DFIs work together, with especially here on investment in this region, that would make uh, a bigger impact. And we'll be able to look out more effectively on you know, the climate in impact and other you know, social uh, impacts that may possibly happen in the, in the communities that uh, we're working in. That's, uh, it's raining very heavily here. I'm terribly sorry. I have to stop. Um, yeah, she might be the second. can lose you as we move on, but uh, let me stop there for now. Great. Thank you, Alison. Mm -hmm. uh, so let me go to the next speaker. So, um, Ms. Ashwan Kawaja is advisor on safeguards and sustainability and a former manager of environmental and social standards at the World Bank. Ashwan, may I pass on to you? Thank you so much, Greg, and thank you so much for inviting me to participate in the panel this morning. Um, I read this report with great interest because having worked extensively in Sub-Saharan Africa in the urban sector in slum projects, um, I found that the report presents a number of very beneficial and in fact very timely recommendations um, to answer the fundamental question or the central question that, that was posed. Do environmental and social safeguards work effectively in the context of the urban poor? Uh, infrastructure development and climate change. And I think examining the nexus between these th th three areas and the intersectionality is really important. Um, is the answer to this question, yes, no, or maybe as was, as was uh, indicated in the presentation, uh, in, my, in my humble opinion, I think the answer is yes and more heavily towards maybe. I don't think the answer is no, because I do think by virtue of the fact that the DFIs and governments do have environmental and to a much lesser extent, as was pointed out, social protocols and policies in place, we have something to work with. But clearly there are challenges and the challenges are significant. So what I would like to do to supplement some of these very good findings and recommendations is to offer very two very quick observations to, to supplement them. And the first one has to be really to look at country level systems on environmental and social safeguards um, and, and, and look at any policy gaps that they have with the DFI safeguard policies on informal settle, settlements and informality. And here I'm going to look a little bit more on, on the social aspects. And, and one area where certainly from the World Bank's perspective costs us a lot of angst and a lot of challenges is the whole area of the resettlement and displacement of informal settlers. Now, while most countries have well-defined eminent domain and expropriation laws, very few have legal frameworks and procedures for land acquisition uh, for urban development projects that will displace or, re or involuntarily resettle permanently informal settlers. They go beyond the measures for ensuring, which we have in most of the DFI's policies, that people with no legal rights to occupy the land that they have uh, occupied illegally, uh, to have their livelihoods restored or to provide any benefits. I think one of the key issues, certainly in my experience and those of my colleagues have been, and I think also with talking to colleagues in the DFI community, is the issue that most countries have with this kind of an issue on the displacement of informal set, uh, settlements 
is this pre precedent setting that if livelihoods were to be restored or if any benefits were being given to these communities, uh, that it would be viewed as rewarding illegal behavior. And hence, a very big gap between the policies of the DFIs, certainly with the World Bank and the policies in Sub-Saharan African governments. And it's not just Sub-Saharan Africa, we see this across the globe. So I think thinking a little bit more about what are the gaps between DFI policy requirements and environmental and social safeguards and any, any, any gaps there are with existing legislation. And it goes beyond just this one example, but this is one example. The second observation that I have is really a greater focus on integrating environmental and social safeguards and climate change considerations into wider municipal urban planning. I won't go into more detail there. I hope we can come back to it, but I do think that that nexus that we talked about between effective urban development, climate change, and the effective implementation and application of environmental and social safeguards, that intersectionality really should be brought up to a higher level where we're looking at sectoral level policies of urban development and looking at how we can integrate them into a butter, into a larger urban development policy sector level strategy. So I'll stop there for now. Thanks, Afshanis. Can I move on to, I see hikers back. Heike, Dr. Litzinger, can we, can you, can you hear us? No, we still seem to have a problem. Okay, let me move on to uh, Papa Abdullah Sai is the global lead urban development for, uh, for the Islamic Development Bank. Hi, Greg, can you hear yes. me? Yes, we can hear you. Please go ahead. Hello. Excellent. Thank you very much for this invitation. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that uh, in uh, just a year ago, the ISDB approved its uh, urban sector policy and uh, the uh, urban ho housing and uh, slum upgrading is uh, considered as a central pillar. And I would like to say also we uh, witnessed also the participation, uh, I mean, a great involvement from City Alliance during the regional consultation. And we hope that this sort of a uh, partnership, fruitful partnership will continue in the future. Now to move on on this topic, uh, very quickly, I would like to share uh, basically the ISDB's environmental and social safeguard policy, just few few lines. In terms of the objective, it's uh, the uh, environment and social safeguard policy is considered as an important tool for enhanced development effectiveness with an overarching goal to facilitate achievement of the environment and the social soundness and sustainability of ISDB finance projects. This uh, environment social uh, safeguard policy demonstrates institutional values and commitment to address environmental and social risks and impacts in a structured operational framework across the project cycle, as mentioned by Briony during the, its, uh, its, its uh, presentation. Uh, ensure environmental and social soundness and sustainability of investment. Support integration of environmental and social aspects into the decision making process. And finally, public consultation and disclosure of in, in, information. Now, this uh, policy is anchored into two main principles. The first one is that the, uh, the ISDB seeks to ensure on the basis of Islamic principle that project and finances are environmentally and socially sustainable, thereby assisting our member countries in managing their physical and human resources for the universal uh, common goal of all creation. The second principle is basically the adoption of these uh, environmental and social safeguards derived from the Islamic principle. The first one is trust. The second one is basically justice. The third one is fairness. The, the fourth one, equality, uh, which means basically this, uh, the environmental and social safeguard of the ISDB is very much anchored towards the social aspects. They're, they're basically aiming at ensuring social and economic, uh, economic well-being of uh, humankind. Now, I would like to say that uh, basically when we are processing projects, the climate change screening is really embedded at the early stage of the, uh, of the uh, project development. So right now at the ISDB, when there is a new project, right at the uh, concept, conceptual stage, the climate change screening is, is, is embedded. And there is really taken into account to ensure that these things are developed throughout the, 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 the life cycle of the project and taking into account into the design, in the costing, and during appraisal as well. Now, I think we are talking about these uh, sub-Sahara Africa. 
And there is one feature that we need to highlight is that uh, in the Sub-Saharan Africa region has the greater prevalence of slum in any region in the world. And then it's really urbanizing now. So which means basically there are uh, com uh, compounding uh, informality and inadequate, inadequate living condition in cities. So therefore, if, for instance, just to give a figure, uh, 15 of our member countries have greater than 50% of the urban population living in slums. Uh, and then uh, this condition, one of the major attention and investment in the area of urban housing and slum upgrading. While the later will need to deal with the stock, uh, helping to regularize, regularize informal settlements, provide them with services and secure tunnel, the former will require substantially upgrading housing policy legislation and market-based mechanism to dramatically improve uh, supply capacity to meet, meet, uh, meet growing demand. Now, when we're dealing with infrastructure in cities, we are talking about basically brownfield sites, brownfield areas. So the, the main thing is that people are already living there. And most of the time with their, uh, with their assets, with their, with, their, with, uh, with, with their belongings. So uh, the environmental and social safeguards should be developed at the early stage and ideally with the participation of the local residents and the end users to ensure ownership of the project and to ensure also that their main concerns are taken into account right at the onset of the, of the project. There's just a few things to, to, to highlight. If, for instance, we are dealing with a housing project in a slum area, and most of the time these slum dwellers don't have, for instance, land tunnel, uh, obviously this project can be subject to elite capture, meaning at the end of the project, these, the, the, the previous owners or the previous occupiers may not benefit really from the, 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 the housing that has been developed. Sometimes people are being relocated to new areas without ensuring, for instance, that they, the areas they've been relocated to are subject to flooding or not. So these are issues we need to take into account because otherwise, without a proper uh, sort of stormwater drainage system, uh, the next, uh, next time there is a really heavy rain, this housing could be uh, subject to, to, to flooding. Uh, there are also in Sub-Saharan Africa, often we see that there are uh, people having small shops, small stalls that are installed along the roads and so on and so forth. So when we are doing these road projects, when we are doing these infrastructure projects, we need to ensure that also these people are not just basically being relocated. Why not taking into account this loss of opportunity? Because they, their daily uh, life, their daily uh, their livelihood, their, their, their savings, and, and so on and so forth, were basically uh, uh, selling uh, with these with, with shops and so on and so forth. So we need to take those small things which are impacting the poor urban residents. And then finally, one thing which is very important is, for instance, the road safety in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, focus should be on improving urban road safety at the project design uh, stage, especially for some countries which we witness high road injuries and fatalities among pedestrians, bicyclists, cyclists, and also those are using uh, sort of uh, the two or three wheels uh, 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 vehicles. These should be embedded in the environmental and social safeguards. Now, to answer to the question of uh, Bryony, uh, do existing environmental and social safeguards still work in today's environment? The answer is, uh, can we say yes, depending on the strength of the executive agency. Because at the end of the day, the, 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 the main instrument that is going to implement the project is the executive agency. If you have an executive agency which is very, uh, which, which has got uh, enough capacity really to implement the, 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 the project, even the, with the directives of the uh, DFI, then uh, this uh, environmental and social safeguard and the environmental and social management plan will be implemented adequately. And we can give you some projects where, for instance, uh, people that were uh, uh, living in, the, in, uh, in, in some uh, semi-urban areas because they've been impacted by a pipeline, uh, they've been really uh, uh, compensated. And when you see some, some of these people to build multi-story buildings, it means they've been positively impacted by this, uh, this project. So there are cases where there is existing and really good uh, environmental and social safeguard. And the environmental and social management plan is being implemented because you have a, a, a good executive agency and as well as the DFI is following up to ensuring that this is being done according to the agreements. Now, in some cases where this is where it can be, uh, this uh, can be some uh, some confusion. 
in a project, not often the DFI is financing 100% the whole uh, project components. If, for instance, the environmental and social safeguards or the environmental management plan is down to the country to, 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 to finance it or to, to, to pay for it, then there is little the DFI can say in the implementation. So these are uh, some, some caveats we need to take into account because each project is unique and uh, there are case and case uh, we need to take into account. But uh, more or less, this is the first, I mean, uh, force I wanted to share that yes, if you have a good and positive and strong executive agency, this environmental and social safeguard can be uh, uh, implemented in the right way and uh, the end users can benefit from it. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. I'm going to, so Heike Litzinger has said that she does have issues with her audio. So I'm going to go to Julian Baskin next, who is the principal advisor at Cities Alliance. And after that, I'm going to come back to see if we can get Heike Litzinger. Julian, over to you. All right, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Um, it's a great honor to be on such, such a panel, especially on a subject which I feel so strongly about. I just want to add an, a, a slightly different dimension to this. It's absolutely correct. You know, you, the safeguards themselves depend largely on the capacity of the implementing authority to take those safeguards seriously and the political backing that they get, the political goodwill they get to take the safeguards seriously. But the words I want to bring up now are slightly different words. The first one is trust. Um, informal settlements almost always have a history of mistrust of government. Many times the informal settlements are made up of people who have already been resettled from elsewhere and have been promised development and have been disappointed once and find it very hard to believe government a second time that if they get resettled, the situation will be any different. So building trust is fundamental, not only trust in terms of the settlements, but as Papa Sai said, there are many small businesses, informal economy businesses, that government, local governments have spent sort of their life destroying have chased them off the streets, have confiscated their goods, and suddenly they're meant to believe we're meant to have trust in our discussions uh, with the city authorities. So safeguards are something that have to be built on the basis of trust. And too much we talk about community consultation, community participation. It's much more than that. It really is about demonstrating to communities that the dialogues that they are engaging with are dialogues that will truly be respected and that what people have to say will truly be taken into consideration. Now that is very, very difficult to achieve because also within informal settlements are rumors. There are all sorts of channels of different information that can pass through communities and people choose what information they're going to accept or not accept. And most time, the most negative story is the story that is the one that resonates the most. So the next word, so the first word was trust. The next word is we have to have a structured dialogue. It can't just be ad hoc arriving in the communities and saying, we want to talk to you about the safeguards. We have to set up within these communities, within all the informal settlements throughout the city, the dialogue mechanisms in the form of whatever type of forum that is, that people know this is the structured place where views are exchanged. It's not the place, rumors, are, if they don't take place through the formal, through the, through the, the forums are not the avenue. In other words, you need to have trust built on structured dialogue. And then the third word I want to talk about is really communication. You really have to come to these dialogues with clear information. You can't have different people presenting different information, using different words, promising different things. You have to have a clear message that you're giving the communities. And so I believe that the safeguards to be successful really depend on a great deal of upfront investment work that's done within the communities, which already creates the environments of dialogue, already creates the environment of trust between national government, local government, and communities. And so to me, when we get to the safeguard place, safeguards should be based on projects that people know where those projects came from. They aren't just thrust upon them. So for example, we know that in Kampala, National government through its different ministries have something like 14 large scale projects that will be implemented across the city. 
The city itself does not know about these projects. There's not a single map that exists where all 14 projects and the right of ways uh, are mapped. So there is no guarantee actually to communities that if they get relocated once to somewhere else, another project might not come along and say, well, you need to relocate again because here is another national priority uh, to, be, to be implemented. Um, I don't want to go into too much, but just, just my final comment is, is that safeguards are really to be successful or a mixture of good policies and instruments and procedures, which I believe the DFIs and with some of the caveats that were mentioned by Biryani, whether it's better to do a SEA or, uh, and uh, et cetera, with, uh, and whether they include climate change or not, really depend on the authority, as I mentioned earlier, but the political will of government to make sure that the, the dialogues, negotiations, the communications are respected. And uh, I'm actually going to uh, Kampala next week to have this exact discussion with senior government uh, ministers to really say that if this thing is to work, it will only work if government is fully behind it because the safeguards are not something that a loan administration or authority can implement. It really has to become an all of government endeavor and all of government in partnership with communities. Thank you very much, just for those words, thank you. Thank you, Julian. So let me go to our first speaker, who's now our last speaker. So Dr. Heike Litzinger is the head of Urban, De Urban Development Division, the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development, BMZ. Heike, over to you. Thank you very much, Greg. And excuse me, please, for the technical obstacles I had. At least they have one advantage for me. I've heard all your contributions first now, and I think I can leave the notes I have prepared now aside, in which I just wanted to stress how important safeguards are. Uh, everybody has underlined now in a far more differentiated way, and uh, the study was the perfect start of this discussion. It was very helpful already to we have this wrap up of Bryony Wolfsley in the beginning, showing where the challenges with safeguards are. I think it's it was really um, impressing now to hear the practitioners like hints and examples for where we have like the challenges with safeguards. Where do they work? At which stage do they work? And what kind of uh, new uh, instruments do we have to develop to to, to really make them useful, to really answer the question Brownie Wonsley has um, posed at the beginning, uh, do they, are they useful uh, leading us to, the, um, uh, to, to reach the SDGs or where do they uh, still need improvement? Uh, I think this was so far a very helpful discussion. I think um, I'm very curious to hear now what the questions from the audience will be uh, to the practitioners we have heard so far. And I'm very thankful to Cities Alliance and the experts to, to have gathered this panel and prepared this study in the first place uh, to, to show us where we have to continue our work. Thank you. Thank you, Heike. So, and thank you to all our panelists. Um, I'm got, I've got two questions. So the one is a very, very specific question. And the one's a very general political question. So the very specific question, I'm going to go to Bryony and see, see if you can, I can answer it. Bryony, because it came up during your presentation, which was, so you did that, you had that slide about the timing of, 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 of the, the costings and, and, and the approvals, and the financing, but how do we integrate cost estimates in the ESIA when the bill of quantities are provided for in the project in regard to the time taken for the, the loan agreements to be finalized? How, I mean, how do we, how, so how do we get, how do we integrate cost estimates when you don't really know how much it's going to actually cost to do something safeguarding? Um, yeah, that's a very good question. I saw that in the chat. The um, um, the the there are a lot there are a lot of problems around this whole area, and I think this is why the, there are so many problems because. The environmental and social practitioners who prepare the environmental and social management plan do so, first of all, before any contract has been appointed. And secondly, they are not experts in how much it costs to move spoil or you know, whatever it is to do social monitoring or something like that. So they tend to put in, in um, estimates 
which can vary very wide, widely and wildly around. So it's a very inexact science. And sometimes that amount is taken as, as the amount and put into the, the um, loan agreements. Other times, and, and then, uh, yeah, another issue that happens is that the ESIA can often be done on a project. And then after the ESIA is finished, the project increases in scope, in some cases can double. Um, but the original costs stay the same. And then another problem is that, yes, exactly, as the questioner asked, um, you know, some time may elapse between, and, and some studies I looked at can be up to eight years between the completion of the ESIA and, and start of construction. And of course, costs will, will go up in that time and nothing is done to change the costs in the, in the loan agreement. It, it is a very difficult area, um, as I say, because, you really don't know what the costs are until you've appointed the, the contract and you haven't done that until you've got the loan agreement. It, it's an area that, I, and I'm not sure if I know exactly the answer, but it, it does need some more, um, some more study perhaps to, to try and ascertain from live projects, what are the actual costs? So that um, practitioners and consultants and people in the DFI side can get a better um, appreciation and estimate of what the costs are going to be. Um, you know, some things might be easier than others. You know, you're, if you're providing, you know, 10,000 condoms, you can probably price it. But other things are much more difficult to cost. And so, yeah, there could perhaps be a lot more work into how do you price these actions um, and what are reasonable costs or ranges of costs um, to provide guidance for those people who are preparing them. Um, and, and until we start actually accounting for those costs, we won't know. Because that's the other side of the problem is we actually don't know what's being expended on the environmental and social issues because they tend not to be accounted for in, in project auditing um, at all. So we, it's a big unknown area, the whole, whole aspect of finance and costing. So I can't tell you be more certain than that, sorry. Right. Thanks, Brian. Now, I agree. It is a it is a difficult difficult area to quantify when you don't know what you are quantifying. So, can I just also go to the Brian? Please consider yourself to be one of the panelists for for this question as well, which is a a more difficult, more political question, um, and some people would say more sensitive. So, not all stakeholders in sub-Saharan Africa in infrastructure development are as committed to safeguards as others. And in particular, as one of the big infrastructure development donors, um, how do we work around that? Because what you don't want is a whole series of infrastructure projects that have are really committed to safeguards, and then next door to that are other infrastructure projects that have absolutely no commitment to safeguards. And that's more of a political question. So please, any of the panelists would like to be brave enough to respond to that question. And I think you know what I'm alluding to. Maybe could I kick this one off? Please, please. Um, yeah, I do know what you're alluding to. And, and those banks who perhaps don't have their own policies in place rely entirely on um, country national systems for um, both the, the legal requirements, the implementation, monitoring and auditing and enforcement. And as we know, many countries are very weak on that side of things, particularly in the face of, of, of the demands of, of some of the DFIs. So if we're, you know, I think that there's a lot of room for improving the capacity of national environmental authorities to, um, to review the studies. And I think the upfront EIA side of things is, is generally okay-ish. It's the downstream, it's after the approval. It's the whole compliance, monitoring, auditing, enforcement and penalties is, is very weak. Um, and it's for a number of reasons, um, including as, as Julian so eloquently put it, the political will um, and, and other aspects in the country. It can be down to the fact that somebody doesn't have a vehicle. I mean, you know, it could be something as banal as that. So there's a number of reasons. And I think that's where a lot more effort needs to be placed on how to to strengthen those national agencies, which will be the benefit to all DFIs, in fact. 
Uh, Shannon, would you like to say anything? Because I know the World Bank's invested heavily in, in, in safeguards over the last decade or 15 years. I mean, it's, it's, it's a difficult issue. Would you like to have any? It certainly is. It's a very challenging issue. And, and beyond to what you were alluding, and I won't go there. Uh, but just basically, even if you look at um, examples that we have in the World Bank, where we have perhaps um, a, a drainage canal upgrade project that we are financing, uh, but we're only financing a segment of it. And contiguous to it is a segment that the government is financing. And uh, let's take uh, a resettlement action plan. So of course, the segment that the World Bank is financing, uh, the compensation or assistance for loss assets or livelihood restoration obviously is robust in line with the World Bank's policies and requirements. And therefore the people who are affected by that particular segment uh, are going to get a certain package of compensation or restoration, et cetera. And right next to it, you have people where the government is involved and the government may or may not choose to use the provisions of a resettlement action plan that has been agreed to with the World Bank to actually compensate for lost assets and give benefits to those people. And therefore you're setting up this dynamic of having two communities, contiguous project, but one segment World Bank, one not. And it becomes very, very challenging. And I think I'm going back to what Brownie was just saying, one way of looking at it and one, one way we engage in dialogue is to actually look at international good practice and look at it in the rubric of good development and sustainable development. If you want good sustainable development and you want to do what's best for people, uh, then you do have to bring it up to the national policy level. Right? One of the framing questions for this discussion was, what can national governments do better? What can local governments do better? Um, put the DFIs aside for a moment. And I think what they can do is, in fact, in fact look at it in the, in the broader macro lens of good development, good international practice, and, may, and adopt what the DFIs are doing. Because there is, and I, I'm being idealistic, I know. And I can tell you, we've had uh, we've had projects where work have absolutely stopped on our projects because you know you have communities very nearby. It's a perceptional issue from those communities that somehow their needs are not being met. And yet, my neighbor, who just happens to be down the road or down the drainage canal, you know, a few meters, is getting to be much better off than I am. And I'm worse off, and they're better off. So I think we often talk about, and you started off the concept of do no harm. I think we should talk about the concept that we in the World Bank are now going towards, which is do good. And we, to do good, you need to look at the broader socioeconomic impacts and do what's best for the people. Yeah, I think I think do no harm is setting the bar too low. <laughs> Definitely. Um, <laughs> Thank you. In, as there are no other questions, can I ask any of the panelists if they have any final reflections? Um, Heike, Dachma, Alice? Papasai, yes. any? No, I was, uh... okay. May I just um, um, put another question? In fact, uh, I wonder um, whether my colleagues can say something on this binary view of um, having people being legal or illegal. Mm. I mean, I think the report says also something. I mean, there is many shadows. And how far do you see the potential that governments, uh, municipalities, as well as the donor community or, or the banks, can work much more on uh, on uh, different typologies and also the, uh, like if not this binary view and having really looking for solutions with exactly people who have haven't had any solution to find their land and have their assets on the, on the wrong land etc by really looking how do we get out of the situation not only in connection with a specific investment project but also in very general in the urban planning i mean not much is really happening, you know, in solving, you know, the 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 the, the issue of of um, of informal settlements. And I know you inhabited, for example, is working a bit on it. Also, the banks do. But I I wonder, can more be done, and how, in going towards, you know, step by step in not formalizing but finding solutions how how um, such people have an option which is not illegal and which gives them certain rights. Um, not only for companies, certain rights for their development. Good, thank you, Dachma. Who in the panel would like to start the response on that?
where's Julian? I'm sure Julian's got something to say about legal versus illegal. Hi, absolutely. Hi. You know, I, I think the question is what causes the illegality? And I think it's generally recognized that informality is often a function of as a governance issue. It's, it's, it's the fact that the planning and the land administration systems are unable to put land onto the market at the speed in which cities grow. And so people are forced to find land on which, on which to settle. So the reason why I'm saying that is that what we really need to do in the safeguards is link the safeguards to the formalization of the city. There's absolutely no point for giving people some sort of cash compensation and then say, make your own way in a system that where it's almost impossible to make your own way without going back into another slum and densifying another slum or going back, coming illegal, coming uh, an informal settler somewhere else. So the opportunity exists through the safeguards to say, not only do we have a road, but the road can be a catalyst to a process of formalization of the city. And here we have people who are about to be relocated. We know who they are. Let's make sure we relocate them in a way they then become part of the formal city. Whether they get full services or not in, uh, 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 is not the point. The point is that it's on a properly acquired and planned site against which tenure can become secure and long-term upgrading can happen. Good. Thanks, Julian. I Any? think um, also, Please just to add, to, what, uh, to add on what Julian has said, uh, I think the other reason why uh, illegality happens uh, is that when uh, you already have a, a, an urban, uh, sorry, um, a, a master plan for a city, but it's not uh, implemented, it's not enforced. The planning itself is not enforced. Where people can settle is not enforced. So over years, you know, people began to begin to settle on land, let's say railway land, or land that is um, kind of earmarked for, the, for, for, for city development. But nobody's telling them, you know, you need to leave. And then all of a sudden you have a big development uh, project and you want to, to push these people away uh, overnight, in fact, uh, that uh, creates a lot of problems. Uh, also. Thanks. Thank you, Alice. Okay. Uh, is anyone else, anyone else in the panel want to have any last remarks? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, uh, yes, I thought, thought yes. I heard you. Yes. Yes. yes uh, just to say that I think uh, we, we need to strengthen our member countries in terms of capacity building, we need to uh, develop uh, the capacity building. We need to have more national urban planning, uh, more national uh, urban policies uh, to help them really ensuring that development are following uh, a, 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 an overall master plan as mentioned uh, earlier. So that, that uh, these sort of illegalities can be really, uh, 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 let's say, Oh, I think we've lost you too, Papa Zai. Okay, we're having a few Sorry, issues. There we, there we go, we can hear you now. Yes, 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 uh, I was, hello? Yeah, uh, we, we were just losing you, you for a minute, but please try and carry on. Yes, yes, very quickly to say that really, we need to, to, to do more investment in housing informal housing, but especially for the low part of these urban forward that can access uh, the, the market because of the several reasons, then that we, we can deal with this illegality. Thank you. Thank you, Papa Sai. So I'm going to now move on. So first of all, um, uh, Bryony has put stuff in the chat and the link to the actual report is also in the chat to get the full, the full report. So please, all the participants, you can access the report if you don't already have it. I'm going to now ask uh, for some closing reflections from Dr. Stephen Lintner, who is uh, very well versed in this area and is a senior environmental and social advisor. But Stephen, if you'd just like to give us some closing reflections. Um, it's a pleasure to uh, be able to join the session today and be able to review the, uh, the really high quality report that's been prepared. Uh, to me, there are a couple of key points that I would like to make. 
First of all, I think what we need to do is to recognize uh, not uh, that we have these populations that are informally settled, but we have a fundamental problem with the recognition of the extent of these populations in all of the regions and the developing world and the special needs they have. Uh, we're talking about 10, 20, 30, 40, even 50 percent of some urban areas, not just in Africa, having informal settlement. And this is a striking figure, and it's one that the municipal governments largely ignore. They would like it not to be the case. And I think this is really important. And although we've focused on environmental and social safeguards in this discussion, what we've not heavily done is link this with the question of urban planning, urban development. Because if you look at the question that was asked, are environmental and social safeguards suitable tools? I would say certainly they're suitable tools, but they're part of a toolkit. And they're tools that have powerful application in very specific settings. Uh, I would argue that currently the state of the art in terms of using environmental and social impact assessment, when linked, very strongly noting, when linked with environmental and social management plans, which have responsibilities laid out, costing laid out, timing laid out, so these can be integrated into the project design. This works well, but it's project specific. These urban areas need additional tools. And I think strategic environmental and social assessment is a very good tool. It's one that's expensive to use and it's heavily process oriented. And I think one of the things we need to recognize is there is a general reluctance of governments at the national or municipal level to borrow money for planning work. And so I think this is a place where the bilateral development organizations, we have both Germany and Switzerland represented here. Historically, Japan's been very heavily involved in urban planning. We need to basically go to the bilateral development organizations which are interested in this problem and get them to support strategic assessments linked with planning processes. I think this is really critical because the multilateral development banks are providing either hard loans or soft loans. So they're not particularly attractive sources of financing, uh, but they are important partners to involve in this. Uh, when we look at this question of what are we going to need to do in the urban areas, one of the things that's very, very striking, and I think this is where the assessment process, including in particular, the social assessment process is critical, is these urban areas are gonna to have to be densified. And this is what you're seeing in South Asia, you see it in East Asia. Uh, the World Bank's been involved in Brazil, it's been involved in India, uh, it's been involved uh, in other countries with this issue of vertical resettlement. These cities are getting so large that you cannot basically responsibly resettle people because mm -hmm. they're too far from their places of work. So for example, Afshan and I were involved in Indonesia in a World Bank project for dealing with drainage crisis and flooding. The World Bank uh, with the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank has a project in Manila to deal with flooding. Uh, that one involves ultimately a program of which will need over 1 million people relocated uh, to secure them. And so the, the idea that the cities can expand uh, infinitely is, is becoming very questionable in a lot of settings. So I think we need to look at very complicated social settings uh, and recognize that you do have in New York City, each apartment building is a vertical village and creating villages that are, that are vibrant is something I think we need to look at more. One of the points that was made by, by Julian um, is extraordinarily important. And that is this, this quartet of points, trust, structured dialogue, communication and political will. Uh, if you really look at the purpose of environmental and social assessment, what's it really about? It's about informing decision-making. 
informing decision making very broadly. It's both a process and a product. There's way too much emphasis on the product part, too little emphasis on the process part. But in dealing with informal settlements, you really do need to have that trust. You need to deal with communication. Rumor definitely is a huge issue. The communication is slow and you've got to develop political will. And that's why I would argue that the strategic environmental and social assessment process needs to be linked from direct project investments. It's too heavily linked and rationalized by project investments and made part of the planning methodology and the planning approach. And that we need to recognize that for, for these things to be effective, they can't be studies. They have to be processes which underlie a continuous process of updating because the cities are very, very dynamic. Uh, another point I'd like to make, and it, it feeds into what people have been saying, in terms of climate change, all the multilateral development banks uh, look at climate change. You heard from the Islamic Development Bank. They've got a very good strategy on climate change, for example. Asian Development Bank's not here, but they've got really good work they're doing on climate change. But one of the things that we need to collectively recognize is we need to have a parallel focus, not what the project is going to do in terms of climate change, where most of the energy is, most of the concern is, but in this setting we're dealing with, the Cities Alliance is dealing with is what will be the impacts of climate change on the project? And this is really inadequately examined. Uh, and it really drives siting, it drives scaling of infrastructure. And so I would say on the climate change issue, we have got to balance the focus. Uh, if you look at cooperation on climate change with national governments, it's very, very heavily on meeting the nationally determined contributions, which is absolutely critical. But how do we deal with resilience and how do we deal with resilience in informal settings where you don't have the normal planning tools that you're going to be using? So I think the session today has been excellent. I think it really shows the richness of ideas. Uh, the study that's been prepared for Cities Alliance uh, is a good study, it's a thoughtful study, and it's an insightful study. The real question is, how do we collectively uh, move from the study and the stimulating discussion today to really get action on the ground? Because what are environmental and social safeguards about? They're about getting better development outcomes. That's why they're there. Better environmentally and social sustainability of the projects and programs and better outcomes, which get back to the very basic introduction here. We want people not just to be equally off, we want them to be better off after these types of interventions. So it's been a pleasure to be able to listen to everyone here today. Thank you, Stephen. So just then, in closing, I mean, I think we all, all of us here and others are involved in safeguards. Um, as Papa Sai said, we absolutely need partnership for this. Uh, we need to support each other and learn from each other going forward. And this report therefore represents just part of that process. So this is not a report that you read and put on your shelf and then you move on to the next thing. We need to have a process where we constantly come back to this and constantly reinforce each other and constantly work together um, to ensure, as Stephen has just said, that we have better development outcomes, because that's our ultimate aim. And I just think there's some really interesting things that have been said today, and I just like to pull out some of these words that we need, that we that sometimes feel softer words, but are really at the heart of, of our work in development. Trust, justice, fairness, equality, honest communication, inclusion, political will. And if we don't get those things right, the infrastructure doesn't happen. So, and then just also just to emphasize what Stephen says, I mean, I just think the climate change effects are constantly growing, which is just another reason why we need to constantly come back and, and reinforce us uh, and strengthen our safeguards. And we can only do that together. So my thanks to Bryony for the hard work on the report and the presentation. Thank you, Bryony. Thank you to SECO and BMZ for their support in actually doing the report. So thanks to both governments. Um, thank you to Heike, Dagmar, Alice, Ashwan, Papa Sai, and Julian for your for being on the panel. 
Uh, thank you to Stephen for those wonderful closing remarks. And of course, thank you to the participants for attending. Uh, thank you for attending the session and enjoy the rest of the day or evening, wherever you are. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Bye. everybody. Bye. Everyone, bye bye. See you next time.